We're back. Hi. <laughs> okay. We're just, I think this is working. Um, hi. For those of you who have joined already, okay, yes, look, we have people, they're joining. Um, I'm Tiffany, this is Chris. Um, I am one half of Little River Co-op, the urban farm in downtown Alapata, and Chris is the farmer behind French Farms. He's the guy that grows most of the produce that we sell, and he's also um, an experienced edible gardener. He works part-time with Ready to Grow Gardens, and he's been doing that for a really long time. And um, I just want to mention the fact that we are quarantine buddies. So that's <laughs> why we're sitting so close together without masks on. We are partners and we live together. So, we garden together. And we garden together and we talk about plants together. So that's one of the reasons why we're here together um, on a private property where there are no other people. And so yeah, we're like, we're, someone we're said, being- Someone asked if they, they said that we couldn't hear. Can you guys hear us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Somebody say yes. Someone <laughs> say yes if you can hear us. <laughs> no? Uh-oh. Okay, yeah. Yes, what? That's me though. Yes, you can hear me? Okay, cool, all right, perfect. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk for kind of a long time because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I've never done an Instagram Live video, but I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna set half hour timers and we're gonna go for half an hour and then I'm gonna upload that half hour to our story so that it saves for 24 hours for people who can't make it now. And then I'm gonna start a new one. So I'll mention that. I'm gonna set a timer now for half an hour. And at the half hour mark, I'll be like, okay, bye everybody. And then I'll kind of like refresh. Also, we have ancient iPhones and we're afraid of them um, running out of batteries. Okay, so, um, also, oh, also, we're not gonna answer your questions uh, in live, live. So if you have a question and you wanna wait till the end, we're gonna do a and A at the end. And I think you can also like send us digital questions, I think, although I've never done this before. Um, because if we answer your questions, we're gonna get way off topic. And we want to cram a lot of information into you today. We're gonna be talking today. about the, the life yeah. cycle of a white fly real quick. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so look. We've noticed that because of the coronavirus and people staying at home and people thinking more about the food system and food security, that there's like a lot of new interest in growing food for yourself at home, which is super cool. It's what we do for a living, so we are here for it, for all of the new enthusiasm. But um, April is the tail end of the annual vegetable growing season in South Florida. So I'm not gonna say there's nothing you can do in your garden. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do in your garden, but. Like we just had the last harvest at the farm. So yeah, like the we, farm is closed. I mean, there's farms that are open. Not all farms are gonna close, but it's just saying like, from what the species that I grow, we are done for the year because it's no longer profitable. But. There's but okay so there's <laughs> there's stuff you can do but our seasons are reversed from the rest of the US and that can really trip up new gardeners especially if they moved here from somewhere else and they're bringing experience from like a northern client uh, climate then they think they know a little bit about gardening then they come here and they get like walloped by our reversed seasons um, so something like a beefsteak tomato you're gonna want to plant in October that's the beginning of our season. We grow vegetables all winter. Things like spinach, lettuce, strawberries, snap peas, those are like literally you can only grow them for like the coldest four months of the year, which are November, December, January, February. This time of year, you're gonna have to look to the tropics for inspiration for what to plant now. Um, I wanna, I brought you a, I brought you like a little printout. Hold on. Okay, so 
Okay, look. Can y'all see my map? Oh, now I'm losing all my other papers. Okay, look. This is the USDA plant hardiness zone map. So the USDA prints, makes this once a year. Um, they compile not just temperature. So I know it looks like one of the um, like meteorological like it's raining here and there's like snow here whatever or a dream political map or something okay um so like basically it, it splits the u.s up into all of these sections based on like earliest frost date latest frost date rainfall humidity percentages averages temperature up and down all that stuff and then it makes the u.s into sections so there's whole areas that are in one really really popular zone like yellow is seven eight seven and eight uh, i've noticed that like six seven and eight like in the middle like most of the u.s is in those hold it higher okay so then like all, all of those people they all get to share resources resources like books and all of the universities in those areas get to um like share data and do research together and so planting dates for example in a lot of books or on the backs of seed packets they're going to be very focused on these people because there's way more of them right look look at a little florida we we have our own color down here okay look and actually this map is a little bit oversimplified there's actually sub zones so we're in zone 10b so this map, this kind of like pinky South Florida one, this is like below Lake Okeechobee, that's all 10. And we're 10B, so we're actually like just this little niblet down here. That means that we are not included in a lot of like books and general literature. And like I give the back of the seed packet as a really um, good example because they ha they'll have a really oversimplified version of this on the back of a seed packet and what they do is they just gray out South Florida <laughs> they don't even include it they're like the seed packet is too small so we're just not gonna talk about Florida don't look down there like don't look at that because the planting it's like too complicated so but we're in that don't look down there so basically um, if you zoom out further from just the US you'll find a lot of places that have a really similar climate to us they're just not in the continental US so um, all of the Caribbean that's a really good place to look for research about like cuisine you know mm -hmm. so it's like what kind of countries have tropical climates okay those people's cuisine are what we need to look to for inspiration for growing during our hot months so like in india parts of the rainy parts of india where they have monsoon seasons like southeast india that's a really good example yeah you're going to want to get an indian eggplant not an italian eggplant or you're going to want to grow turmeric instead of oregano um to mention the italian thing a lot of people think like okay hot that makes sense we're hot they're hot like Italy's hot California is hot Florida is hot We're we're all hot I'm sure we all grow the same things but let me tell you humidity is a thing it's a real there's our humidity is like absolutely different than the like desert hot climates so that's gonna like totally change the um, the types of things that you can grow the humidity it's like a really big deal um so like turmeric ginger lemongrass india you know callaloo which is also called amaranth ahi dulce like kachucha peppers well, i'm thinking like the caribbean you know yeah. like all of those you need to kind of like expand your research horizon thing to other areas that are hot all the time and really humid in order to get inspired for summer growing which is like what we're doing now um chris is also super um passionate about nighttime temps oh yes yes because it's always a thing like it's hot everywhere like i see my friends in kansas their tomatoes grow great or or even they'll have uh, i'm trying to 
to get a plane. Right? It's anyway. hot in New York in the summer. Yeah, it's hot in New York, but um, what you're forgetting is that their nighttime temps are going down, especially places that are more inland. And they're going down into the seven, low 70s, high 60s. And a lot of these plants that love as much heat and as energy they can get from the sun during the day, in order for their flowers to work, or their plants to work, they're gonna they're gonna need a cooler nighttime temperature, and so that's why you have to be careful with that. And also the humidity thing, humidity at night is just breeds a lot of disease and pests, and the plants are already stressed because it's summer and they don't want to survive in this heat. So, um, so yeah, it's not like plants don't want to survive. It's more like Western European annual vegetables. They don't want to survive because they haven't been bred for this. So what I mean when I say that is like radishes, broccoli, kale, carrots, lettuce. Those things are, we can grow them. And again, people grow them when it's hot out. So they think of them as heat loving, but those are cool weather crops, cool weather. Like you can push snow aside and harvest kale you know like so you're kind of supposed to be growing it like that we really really think it's super important um, especially if you're a beginner to try and grow with the seasons like I'm always saying that on the phone because I do our customer support because it's my cell phone and people are always gonna want they're gonna be drawn to things that they want to eat that they're used to in the kitchen and so they're gonna want to grow asparagus and artichokes and snap peas and strawberries and raspberries um, but I really want beginners to grow with the seasons instead of against them especially when they're beginners like um, when you're a little bit more advanced, I feel like you can push it. You can try something that's called season extension. Season extension is a thing that farms do into the winter where they'll, you know, put a hoop over a bunch of crops to keep the snow off it and then they'll heat it with gas and they'll keep their spinach or their carrots growing for like an extra two months or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's hard to justify it on the home garden scale. I mean, there's a lot of engineering that goes into it. Sometimes they like cooling the water that they're irrigating with. They have all this ventilation. They might have artificial light. It just goes on and on. And so like, sure, you could do it, but you probably should keep it simple and not do that yes simple and with the seasons like because 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 growing food in your backyard is a hobby right it's supposed to be fun no one is gonna stop going to the grocery store because they put some raised beds in their backyard we go to the grocery store and we own farms it's um it's like it's supposed to be fun, and if you go against the seasons, especially as a newbie, it's not gonna be fun. You're gonna fail a bunch. We know that there's a lot to learn in failure too, um, so we don't wanna discourage anyone from experimenting, but um, I really encourage people that call me and reach out to us for new advice to like go on to Facebook groups and um, use the internet a lot as like a really great to uh, tool for research because if you have a question about something growing in South Florida, someone has for sure already asked that question and someone else has for sure already answered it for them. So one of the best things that you can do with the plant hardiness zone information is use it when you're Googling stuff. And um, I like to use artichokes as my example for that because when I first moved back to Miami with an interest in gardening like eight years ago, I was like, I'm gonna grow my favorite food, it's artichokes. Um, <laughs> and um, like, P.S., they do not grow here, no one grows them, like don't even try, but I didn't know that. And then I Googled it, like how to grow artichokes. If you just Google how to grow artichokes, you're gonna find a website that sells starters. You're gonna find a bunch of stuff about like when to plant it and when to harvest it that's like not for you and if you google how to grow artichokes in zone 10b instead zone 10b that's like the key word then you're gonna get like very very specific information to exactly what you're trying to do 
so it's like and it's, it's gonna say don't do it it's like the secret code password <laughs> entry thing into like using the internet in like a really useful way I like I like to, to always put the the acronym IFIS which is the the University of Florida extension um, IFIS I forget what it stands for like uh, anyway we don't need to go into oh that oh my god we don't even know what it stands for uh, I F <laughs> A S Iphis, and anyway, I whenever I Google any plant thing, I usually start with that, and that gives me some relative or er, information to to Florida. So yeah, so. But okay. we want to talk about two more things right on the on like the, the, the how the shade isn't enough. Right? Oh yeah, okay. Well, so season extension. I've noticed. Um, I'm part of like a South Florida gardening group, and I answer a lot of questions there. I noticed that a lot of people come to the conclusion that because it's too hot out, they can just put shade over their garden and that will make it less hot which is true ish yeah it will maybe become less hot but but um, <laughs> plants need a lot of sun to grow well and they also need the climate they want and if you so if you have a if you're like i'm gonna grow lettuce and i'm just gonna shade it out you're only gonna get it down to about like the temperature in the shade and your plant's not gonna have any sun so really about 60 percent shade is all growers will mess with and growers all over the south extend their lettuce season they start their lettuce season early with shade but nobody goes up to 90 I don't think maybe they try but plants will just not grow so you can't just like say I'm gonna grow in the shade because it's cooler you're only gonna get it a little bit cooler and you're gonna take away the Sun's energy and the, whatever you're trying to do is probably not gonna work anyway so shade does work it helps out but you can't you can't just keep adding shade because, yeah, it doesn't work. Um, another thing that I want to mention really quick that I've noticed a lot of people doing is they think that because something is in season now, they can plant it now. And there is like a really huge time difference. So, for example, like Chris right now is uh, harvesting and selling cherry tomatoes at his farm. Mm -hmm. But he planted those cherry tomatoes in... January? Uh, yeah, January. Okay, January. So, which was very late, by the way. Which anyway. is super late. A lot of people plant their cherry tomatoes in like September, October. So, like, people will say, oh, like, my pepper, I'm getting a bunch of peppers, I'm gonna start more. You know, I'm getting a bunch of tomatoes, or I bought tomatoes at the local farm, so I'm gonna grow my own tomatoes. Or and I saw French Farms eggs plant, they look great. I'm gonna grow eggplant right now because that's what's in season. But no, like, you gotta, you gotta understand that there's a huge lag on some of these crops, like it's three, four months. So, you know, you have a long, long, hot summer to get that plant through. And it might be, it might look like it's growing now and be doing great, but those nighttime temperatures will get you. The eggplant or that tomato is gonna stop setting fruit. Okay, also, I just wanna say, we sound like total downers right now. We're getting it's better. through, yeah. We're getting through um, like what not to do and then we're gonna do uh, yeah. what to do afterwards. We wanna be like, don't do this, don't do this. We should, we should, yeah, people oh, probably but, wanna talk about plants. No, no, do oh. bolting flavor insects. Oh, I'm gonna go more, get a bolting lettuce. Hold one on, more thing about, about why we don't grow certain annual vegetables in the summer is because the flavor really goes down the tubes. I don't know if anybody has like pulled that carrot out of their garden right now. And I know it's your carrot, so you think it tastes really good but it probably is a little spicy and doesn't have a lot of sugar content. Cool weather and a lot of these annual vegetables that we grow is responsible for making them really sweet. So our lettuce is sweet because of the cool weather, our carrots are sweet, even our tomatoes. My tomatoes, they aren't tasting as good as they would a month ago because of the nighttime temperatures. So Tiffany here has well, probably it. something that a lot of you, oh yeah, here it comes. This is the bolting lettuce um, and it really, so, yes, this looks like nothing like you see at the grocery store, right? And maybe you planted there. this in your garden okay, and you'd be I'll like, I it. never got lettuce. <laughs> this doesn't look right. But this is basically what a lettuce plant does when it's flowering. And it hasn't made flowers yet. It makes, it's going to make flowers right there. Where's the camera? It's, it's going to start making <laughs> flowers right out of there. But anyway, this lettuce, while it is very beautiful and looks like a Christmas tree. Oh, no. Look. It's got white sap coming oh. out of it. Oh, it's not focusing. Okay, look, it's full of sap. Basically, yeah. a lot of plants that we eat, we eat them as little babies. Sorry, but it's true. Like a lettuce like from that is harvestable and delicious and we sell it to people and it's like, wow, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. That's like that veal. Is a, 
That's like an itty bitty baby lettuce. This is like um, yeah, this is a grown up lettuce, and something in nature, okay? Because nature is powerful. Something in nature told this lettuce, hey, you don't have much longer. It's getting really hot, or it's getting really humid, or both. Like. Your life is over soon, and you need to do the thing that you were created to do, which is reproduce. Make so some seeds. it's turning into a stalk, and then it's flowering, and that is referred to as bolting when we talk about vegetables. And if you plant a lettuce now, there's, it's just, it's gonna do this. Guaranteed. It's gonna do that. Nature wants weeks. it to do this, even if it does it, and it's only this big. You know, you'll see your lettuce start to do this thing that we call stacking. Even if it's teeny tiny, three weeks old, a month old, a little seedling, it'll start to stretch and get really tall. And the flavor is absolutely different. It's a mature plant. There's it's just like, totally different chemistry in there. Like the plant is going into a whole different mode. Yeah. Right. So like this is nature telling this plant that this climate is not good for it. You can still eat it though. It's just oh. really bitter. It's like, but don't. Yeah. No. And you talked about the bitter carrots. And what about yeah. farty kales? Did oh, I didn't talk about farty, farty kale? kales. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we still have beautiful kale plants and beautiful spigarello plants in our backyard garden, and and we're gonna keep them happy as long as we can. But their flavor has changed. Mm -hmm. They, they have like a little bit of a we call it like the brassica fart taste to them. Um, and you can smell it if you harvest a big bowl of kale. And even even a lot of the produce that comes from the Central Valley, California, a lot of times you're like, this this broccoli rob is so bitter and tastes like fart. <laughs> and that's because it was probably grown in like 110 degrees out in the desert. Um, but anyway, so the brassica family, they as it gets really hot, they their flavor changes immensely. And because again, they go brassicas, from sweet kale to yeah, they're cool weather crops. The thing I said earlier about pushing the snow aside and harvesting the kale. That's like probably the best kale. That's like kale at its most supreme flavor experience. Mm -hmm. And then kale that is surviving the summer is kale that is actually while alive decomposing already. And that's actually the smell. It's true. It's true. That, the, that's, the cells are breaking down in the living plant. And that is the stinky. Yeah. That's where the kale fart stink comes from. The plant's from. trying to figure out how to hell to make some seeds before it dies. Okay. okay, so look, that was like the don't do all this stuff part of the class. What we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about two main systems of growing in your backyard that are tropical friendly or that you guys are gonna end up doing. One is a raised bed full of annual vegetables. That's how people grow during the winter. You know, you build a wooden raised bed, you fill it with soil, you plant plants in it that are annuals, okay? Annual plants just last one season. Another criteria for a plant that's gonna go into a raised bed is that it's gonna take up roughly no more than two square feet. Okay, so it's for s smaller plants. That's where like your arugula and your Thai basil and your carrots and I mean, your you radishes could plant and your a mango in there though, right? That's not helpful. Okay. <laughs> it's for small annuals, right? And it's constantly in rotation and you're harvesting and you're putting new stuff in and you're refreshing the soil with compost. The other system, so we're going to talk about what you can plant in a system like that. And then we're going to talk about what you can plant in a food forest, which is a very broad term that refers to basically like edible landscaping is another term for it but food forest is one that's going to get you a lot of information if you google it it's where the gardener that's you you know picks plants that in a way that mimics a, how a forest happens naturally do you want to explain that a little bit a little. i have a little drawing for you guys look yeah, so I mean this is a black hole of fun stuff to dive into here, but in general what you what you do is you We're sort of mimicking the architecture yeah. of a forest Now they can't see us though, right? I know but it's because of all the little light. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if this, this picture is that. Okay. All right Well, we, we have one here. We're gonna show you. Okay. We, yeah, we're gonna go walk around and look at the food forest. So basically Yeah, you're, you're gonna have plants that are tall. Maybe it's a uh, in relationship to each other So you know, there's a lot of flexibility here, mm -hmm. you know, it, do, it doesn't you don't have to have a huge mango tree in your food forest. Anyway, so you could have 
you have some trees, you have some things that are really tall, maybe maybe they make a little bit of shade in the heat of the day. You have some things that are medium sized. Oh, it says picture is good. Okay. Um, and you have some things down low, maybe like a ground cover. Um, and so we're, I don't know, are we going to do that now? We'll, we'll walk over there no, and take no. a look at it? No, no. You want me to keep talking about plants? Well, look, okay, so there, the food forest, the way that it's situated is like, there's an upper canopy, which is like kind of a big tree, a big tree. It might be a tree that already exists in your yard. But we don't love the upper canopy. We actually like nerdily talk about how we want to cut the upper canopy out of a lot of people's food forests because it provides eventually so much shade when you plant like a giant tree like a mango as the upper food forest, as the upper canopy. But then there's like dwarf fruit trees under that, then a shrub layer, then an herbaceous layer, which is like annual or perennial herbaceous plants. And then there's like the surface, the soil surface layer, which can be like a ground cover, a, a trailing vine or mulch. And then there's the root layer, which is like things that you're growing underground. Ground. And then there's a vine layer, which is like vines that grow up. Do you want to go look at the food forest? Oh wait, okay. No, no, I'm not going to move us yet. Okay. Chris is going to talk about his favorite plants to go in a food forest. Cause the thing about the food forest is making sure that within the space you have, there's room for all the different growth patterns yeah. of plants. So every plant that you want to put in there falls into one of the categories that I just mentioned. So like a mulberry is like the dwarf sub tree layer. A sweet potato is the ground cover layer. One of the reasons why all of these plants can live in harmony together and create a guild, that's the fancy name for like their happy little life together in your yard, is because they're all taking up different spaces so they're not competing you know sometimes they compete but yeah that's they okay. can compete for sun but anyway there's always going to be winners and losers here okay what do you want chris um okay so yeah we're going to start we're going to pretend that i have about like 20 foot by 20 foot space in my yard and i want to make a summer garden or a food forest i'm only calling it a food forest because i'm going to have some things that get tall first thing i'm going to plant it's gonna be a moringa. This is, you'll see this growing in a lot of people's yards. It's gonna be one of my shade species and it's gonna grow really fast and it's gonna add nitrogen to the soil. I can eat the leaves. There's a million things you can do with moringa. So Most nutritious leaf in the world. Most nutritious leaf in the world. So I'm definitely gonna have one of these because I love to have greens Talk in, about coppicing it. In, the, in the summer. If it gets too big, I can chop it down. If my friends want some, I can just give them a stick and they can plant it in the ground. So I also like that about it. I'm not married to it, and it's just gonna be more of a support plant at first. Um, then I'm gonna, what are some other big things I'm gonna plant? While we're on the subject of legumes, I'm gonna also plant a pigeon pea, also called gondules. This is gonna be a plant that maybe gets head high. It's sort of also kind of large, providing some shade, um, and it's gonna make me edible beans that I'm gonna have to shuck myself, uh, which is gonna be a lot of work. Um, I'm also a really big fan of plants that are in the hibiscus family and they grow really well in the summer and they get big and they give us edible leaves and they give us edible fruit. This is roselle or this is like every this is like an amazing plant. So sh this is the herbaceous the shrub layer. Yeah, hibiscus tea. You know, if you have hibiscus tea or uh, hamica or sorrel drink or any of these things. This is, Florida, the, Jamaica, yeah. this is the plant it's coming from. Once again, it's a large shrub. It's going to take up a lot of space and so um, you should Google what they look like. Google hibiscus plant or cranberry hibiscus plant, and then you'll get a really. They look, yeah, but also in terms of spatial needs, no, they they take up the same amount of space as like a, a hibiscus shrub in your yard. Sure. Is it shrub layer? Shrub layer. Okay. Uh, another large shrub. Herbaceous layer. Well. Yeah, come on. Oh, this is an herbaceous. Okay, I so this so. is lemongrass. Lemon Another grass. one of our favorites. It's a very fast grower. Um, it is nice because it's a grass and we need to have a, a grass in our guild that, you know, we're, we didn't mention this yet, but biodiversity is really important oh, yeah. out here mm -hmm, in the food mm -hmm. forest. So we're going to want to have uh, a bunch of different types of plants from different plant categories. And so we need to have a grass. Also, it's good medicinal, good for making tea and for doing some Thai cooking. Who else do you want? 
Ooh. Um, oh, just so you, I also have a fence in my imaginary food forest. And so I'm definitely going to plant, it's a chain link fence, but you can use a wood fence too. I'm definitely going to plant a passion fruit. I love passion fruit. I love the way it's crazy and grows all over everything. Maybe it's going to grow all over my moringa or my pigeon pea. And maybe I'll stop it a little bit, but kind of let that kind of thing happen. You need to embrace the sort of rambunctious garden here a little bit if you're going to grow these plants. This is not going to be manicured landscaping ever. Um, another one I really love is Katuk. Uh, this plant can grow in the full sun, but I, this is a nice one because it likes a bit of shade and it seems to have better flavor. It, You're supposed to grow it in the shade traditionally. It's right, grown yeah. in the shade with a ton of very nutrient dense compost on it and it'll force the growing tip to grow very fast and it'll make a really tender shoot and then you can break off the top of the shoot like where it naturally breaks and then that'll be your like tropical asparagus. Yeah, or you can just eat, yeah, that's the, that's, that's that's the real way to grow. To but grow. you can but also you can just, eat the whole thing. You can eat the leaves, they can stick to the inside of your salad bowl, it's great. <laughs> and it tastes like peanuts, it's really good. Okay, what about, here's a, here's a okay. ground cover layer. Okay, so this this is a seminal pumpkin. This is going to be one of the more challenging plants in the garden. Uh, pumpkins can get really, really big if they're happy. If they're unhappy, they just sort of get annihilated by worms because like maybe you didn't look at them and notice that it was happening. Maybe they wilted and then made themselves susceptible to pests or something like that happened. But if it does well, it's a really, really fun one and it, it'll grow all summer and make you big, well, medium-sized pumpkins by like September, October. Once again, there is a delay. It's not like you're eating the food you're planting right away on that one. Ground covers. There's okay, another, more ground this covers. This is a really popular ground cover. The almost probably one of the, the best yeah. ground covers in your food forest. This would be a sweet potato, um, and it'll be an aggressive, an aggressive vine that grows out. Uh, the more cuttings you put into the ground, the more potatoes you'll get. You just have one plant. You'll get a lot of vegetative growth, but you won't get a lot of uh, roots. Also, though, I'll say that the vegetation is edible. Like, um, it's edible. People eat it in yeah. tons of different countries, but not America. We're not used to it. But um, your plant will also benefit from getting its vegetation pruned regularly because it'll force a lot of its energy down into the roots for making you more food down there. So. Um, farms will traditionally go through and like mow their sweet potato fields, which is like a very fast way of like just pruning all the greenery off. And so you can prune the greenery off on a smaller scale and eat it. And then it'll make you more sweet potatoes. Sure. Who do you want next? Um, let's talk, yeah, let's talk about, give me the papaya, yeah. Okay, so. And then I, we're gonna walk into the food forest. So papaya is another one that I really like to grow in the summer, uh, very fast grower. Uh, if you do it right, you'll definitely get fruit uh, with under a year, like uh, maybe five, five to eight months or something like that. They're very fast growers. So once again, it's making some shade. Um, if you got iguanas, they're gonna find it. Oh. So watch out, watch out. Papayas are very yummy when they're small like this to iguanas. But what's what I love about papayas is that they're really low commitment and they're really fast. I love planting fruit trees for people that make them fruit really fast. That's why some yeah. of my, our favorite fruit trees to plant for people are everbearing mulberries, papayas, and bananas and star fruit. Um, papayas aren't even trees. They're herbs. You can cut down a papaya with like a kitchen knife because it's completely hollow on the inside. Mm -hmm. If you plant one now, you're going to start getting fruit in the fall theoretically if everything goes according to plan you got the sunshine and you got the sunshine on it and stuff and then you'll be harvesting fruit we, we're harvesting fruit now so we harvest fruit like all winter and then into the next summer and then when it's done you can just chop it down put it in your compost and plant something else there which is really cool yeah. okay so look what we're gonna do is we're gonna get up and move which I'm really scared about because uh, you're on a tripod we're going to go into the food forest and Chris is going to walk you around our food forest and then we are going to stop this live video and start a new one. So I know that's like kind of annoying but this website recommended it because we want to save it. So they were like do it in clumps, like short clumps so in like five or six um, minutes when we're done with that tour I'm going to cut this off and then we're going to start a new one. And also I see, I can't help but read the questions. A ton of people are asking about growing stuff in pots. A really big, a fruit tree is never gonna like it in a pot. That doesn't mean that you can't keep a fruit tree in a pot for a while, but there's being in a pot, okay, a plant in a pot is completely reliant on you for all of its inputs. Okay, you've put it, 
You've put a barrier between it and anything that it's been. You're its captor. Naturally bred to do. Like make really big root systems and forage for water and mineral and nutrients you know so anything you keep in a pot it's like if it's gonna get specific minerals it's only from you if it's gonna get water it's only from you if it's gonna get more soil soil inputs and fertilizer stuff it's also only getting it from you I feel like that is the main challenge in growing something in a pot um, I think a good rule of thumb is however big the plant is above ground, it needs to be, the pot needs to be that big. So, is that That's Well, no, it's like the pot needs to be massive, I guess. Like For if you're going to grow, yeah, if you're going to grow like a mulberry or um, like a moringa, a really healthy one that's going to make you like actual food in a pot, it's going to need to be like a 150 gallon pot. And if you've never seen a 150 gallon pot, they're like uh, like jacuzzis. It's like a jacuzzi. So you need to really be ready for that or your plant is going to be alive. You know, but not acting like a plant should be. Do you know what, does that make sense? You're not growing food. You're not gr you're not going to be growing food. You're going to be growing a plant. You're going to be keeping a plant alive. I guess. You're going to be keeping it kind of alive. Okay, yeah. so look, let's get up All and right. go to the let's follow, We're just going to go to the food forest together. We're going on a journey. All righty. How do I turn this thing around? Oh, no. Okay, I'm not turning it around because I don't know how. I'm just following okay. Chris. Okay, we're going past some mulberries. We have a little papaya here. Um, these are both sort of, all of these trees that we have at this food forest, uh, Sawyer, can you stop barking for a minute, are pretty small and fast growing. So that's why we have these. We, you know, this isn't permanent land. So we have, anyway, we have some mulberries and the papayas um, moving along here to kind of a better part of the food forest. Um, you can really get into it. You can see all of our forest architecture over here. So uh, bananas. Great food forest plant. Can I just say that this, I'm going to back up. This was one little banana plant, you know, like how we sell them, like a knee high banana. So when you plant a banana, this is what you're getting into. And this is yourself. a dwarf variety. Yeah, this is a dwarf. This is a low one. much bigger than this, but it's fruiting. It's fun. We got a little uh, star fruit here. It's a little close to the pineapple, but that's okay. Yeah, that Maybe was a bad choice. Machete down the pineapple and give the star fruit some more space. That was a bad choice. Um, can we go over here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here we have like a little citrus. You know, citrus never do that well, so we just have a little one. Tell them about Kalamondon because someone asked about varieties. Oh, okay, yeah. This is kind of one of the only citrus varieties we recommend is a Kalamondon. Or it's, key lime. And a key lime. Um, it's similar. This is similar to a kumquat in that you eat the whole rind. The sweetness is actually in the rind. And it actually is one of the very few uh, fruit trees that actually will do in a container. They call it the patio citrus. And so if you're going to grow something in a container and you want to have fruit on it, I would the calamondin is the one I'd get. Let me just say that Sawyer's dog nemesis is walking by. So it's going to get barky. Okay, keep going. <laughs> It's gonna get barky. Um, over here, we got another one of our sort of canopy trees. This is the Pakistani mulberry, and it's uh, you can see it's kind of the biggest tree that we have over in this little area. Next Sorry, to it, come here. small pigeon pea. Shh, shh, shh. Um, and then underneath the pigeon pea, we have a unintentional ground cover of one of our favorite weeds called yeah. Biden's elbow. This That's is the my herbaceous annoying layer. thing that gets stuck into your socks and your dog and your. Uh, pants and everything, but it's very nutritious and edible. So we're, we're sort of tolerating it here uh, as a brown oh, cover. Oh, Sawyer, oh my God, the worst. Okay, go to the cherry. Okay, coming around the corner here. Yeah. Going past our mejun tea. Oh yeah, mejun tea. This is a, a really a fun Caribbean plant that does really, really well here. It almost tastes like thyme. Um, so over here we have a, another small tree. This is Barbados cherry. Uh, I love this plant. It has one of the highest concentrations of vitamin C. Uh, takes a lot of wind. It's also sort of Caribbean. Um, 
down below it, we have a ground cover of sweet potato growing, you know, so, and then underneath the sweet potato, we have a thick layer of mulch. Mulch is really important, especially for establishing your food forest. Ideally, eventually your forest will be all plants and there'll be no bare soil, but to avoid the bare soil thing, we usually get tree trimmer mulch. Uh, it's free, it's plentiful, it's packed with enzymes and compounds and minerals from a variety of different plants and we can't say enough about mulch and it will keep your weeds down it'll feed your plants over time it'll encourage biology in the soil it'll help the rain from getting destroyed uh, help sorry help the soil from getting destroyed by the rain yeah. um, and it'll it slowly builds soil like under this mulch there's uh, old mulch and old mulch is worm castings which is soil so yeah. like down here there's really That's good nice stuff, stuff. Yeah. and the only thing that we did to get this nice soil here around our fruit trees is just mulch this area twice a year heavily that's it you know Heavi heavily like heavily a nice thick layer some people put cardboard underneath it to help even more that's a good use for all your amazon boxes you're getting right now <laughs> <laughs> putting a nice put the box down and then put a layer of mulch over there okay so look i'm gonna stop this live video but we're gonna do two more sections of workshop i just want to stop this so that i can upload it with our shaky internet connection and save it so it, it's going to be like a minute and any of you who want to keep learning you can just join the next one we're going to talk about raised bed gardening next so like putting herbs and eggplants and peppers and stuff into like a smaller system and then after that it's going to be like building soil composting mulching cover cropping and cover cropping is critical for your annual bed it's a really cool thing to do for the summer so stay tuned we're just we're just going to start again in like a minute